Tom Morgan, and it is my uh, distinct pleasure to welcome you all to uh, the second in a series of lectures, five uh, programs with the overarching topic, uh, Terrorism and Human Rights. This is number two, and I look forward to this very much. Um, uh, we have lots of people to thank for these programs, and let me tell you who they are because I like doing this. Without these people to support these programs, I don't think we'd have them. So we all are great, should be grateful to them and hope you join me in thanking them. The, um, uh, of course, the Allworth family, who are helping to support the Allworth Center for the Study of Peace and Justice here at the College of St. Scholastica, as well as the Warner Lecture Series of the Manitou Fund, and uh, also special support that we receive on a regular basis from DeWitt and Carolyn Van Ever Foundation and from Mary C. Van Ever in memory of William P. Van Ever, former trustee of the college. Additional funding is, comes from the Global Awareness Fund of the Duluth Superior Community Foundation and from Weekly Reader. Again, thanks to all our sponsors. Before the start, we start the program, I just want to go through what those of you who are regulars are kind of used to hearing me say, but I feel the need to say it again. We have a uh, sign-up sheet in the lobby outside the auditorium. If you're not on our mailing list and you want to be, um, then you'll get a uh, particular you know, notice in the mail of upcoming programs. Um, speaking of upcoming programs, and this is one you will not uh, get in the mail, at least from us, and that is a, a small program that we're doing next week uh, here at Scholastica on Wednesday at 7 p.m. This announcement is a little confusing. It says Thursday, but it really means Wednesday. We're just kidding. Um, uh, a, uh, a, a priest from Colombia will be here uh, to speak about the impact of U.S. foreign policy and U.S. involvement in Latin America and in Colombia in particular. Uh, there are flyers misleading flyers out there about that, uh, telling you that it's Thursday, November 3rd, but it's really Wednesday, November 3rd, 7 p.m. at the Science Auditorium here at St. Scholastica. And that program, by the way, is sponsored in particular by Witness for Peace in the Upper Midwest. Um, in addition to that, uh, some of you got evaluation forms, and if not, you'll find them out in the lobby. We do appreciate that very much getting evaluations of your impressions of the evening, so take a moment to fill those out. We'd appreciate that. I hope all of you got these yellow forms. Uh, something that's worked very well uh, in the past is um, uh, the speakers uh, typically provide us with lots of things to think about and lots of things to concern ourselves with, and so we have a talkback session uh, and I usually try to have these talkback sessions uh, conducted by people with some expertise in the field, and this one is going to be conducted by Professor Haji Dakanchi, Professor of Political Science at the University of Wisconsin Superior. He's, uh, he's from Iran himself, so he knows lots about the Mideast, and he's made a study of this. So join him uh, a week from tonight, Hope United Methodist Church, uh, well, it's all here, Thursday evening at 7 p.m., to talk about tonight's evening and uh, to analyze it a little bit. And we'll talk about our speaker a little bit, too, won't we? Um, and then um, I think those are all my announcements. I can't think of anything else to say except to say that, I, again, I'm very happy that you're here. Uh, our speaker uh, this evening is the Herbert Lehman Professor of Government in the Departments of Anthropology and Political Science at Columbia University in New York. He received his PhD from Harvard University in 1974 and specializes in the study of African history and politics. His scholarship explores the intersection between politics and culture, a comparative study of colonialism since 1452, the history of civil war and genocide in Africa, the Cold War and the War on Terror, and the history and theory of human rights. You see, he's been busy. Before joining the Columbia faculty, Professor Mamdami was a professor at the Uni University of 
Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, and then Makerere University in Uganda, and finally at the University of Cape Town in South Africa. In addition, he served as president of the Council for the Development of Social Research in Africa from 1998 to 2002. He's received numerous awards and recognitions, including being listed as one of the top 20 public intellectuals by foreign policy and by Prospect magazines in, in 2008. His essays have appeared in the New Left Review and London Review of Books and numerous other places. His more recent books include the following, Citizen and Subject, Contemporary Africa and the Legacy of Late Colonialism, Beyond Rights Talk and Culture Talk, When Victims Become Killers, Colonialism, Nativism, and the Genocide in Rwanda, Good Muslim, Bad Muslim, America, the Cold War, and the Roots of Terror, which is the subject of tonight's talk, and most recently, Saviors and Survivors, Darfur, Politics, and the War on Terror. These last two books will be available in the lobby after the lecture, if you're interested. He's married to uh, Mira Nair. She is a filmmaker. And their son, Zoran, is a freshman at Bowdoin College in Maine. The family divides its time between New York City and Kampala, Uganda. I understand more time is going to be spent in Kampala than New York City in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Mahmoud Mamdami. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. But it's always a little difficult to speak in a place uh, to people uh, whom one has not met before. It's like uh, stepping midstream into a set of conversations that you know or don't know much about. So you hope that what you have to say will resonate. Um, I always like to think that uh, there should be a way for the audience to let the speaker know uh, if there's no meeting point. Maybe Tom will uh, uh, take the leadership and just raise his hand if uh, if we're in that situation. Uh, the last time I talked about this book, uh, Good Muslim, Bad Muslim, uh, was a few years ago uh, when I did a book tour in Nigeria. And uh, I was to, I spoke at different university campuses. And uh, I went to a campus in Western Nigeria. And when I arrived there, um, I saw there was police, and uh, I went to the vice chancellor's office, and the vice chancellor told me that uh, the students were demonstrating. So I said, uh, why? He said, well, it has to do with your lecture. Um, I said, why? Uh, why are the students upset? He said, well, they read the title, and they're know that you're coming from Columbia University in the US. They've put two and two together, and they say you've been sent by the Americans to, uh, 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 to speak ill of Muslims. So I said, you mean the Muslim students are demonstrating? He said, yes. Western Nigeria is a sensitive place because population is divided half and half, Muslims and Christians. <clears throat> so I said to him, what are you doing, Mr. Vice Chancellor? He said, well, I've called the police. And he said, what are the police going to do? He said, the police are going to keep the students out of the lecture hall. I said, then who am I going to speak to? <laughs> he said, well, whoever else is there. 
So I said, I don't think that's going to work. Um, can I meet the student leadership? He said, are you sure? I said, yeah. So he called the student leadership. So I said to them, let's have a deal. He said, you come, listen to the lecture, allow me to speak. At the end of it, I will give you the first chance to ask the first question, and you can take as long as you want. No time limitation. So he said, okay. So they came in, and the hall was full. So I gave my lecture. I gave the lecture. At the end of the lecture, the student leader got up, came to the podium, and said, bad title, good lecture. <laughs> Sat down. So I said to him, this title is not mine. This is George Bush's title. Right? Bush kept on talking of good Muslims and bad Muslims. Um, so it's slightly ironic. I know we tend to lose this sense at times like this, but um, it's really the starting point of a conversation, not the end point. So let me tell you what I want to do uh, in the next 45 minutes, one hour. Um, I want to talk of two things, uh, ideas and events. Uh, I think as human beings, we like to make sense of our experiences, of the times we live through, the events we live through. Uh, we like to find some significance, some meaning in these events. And often we also like to take the high moral ground. Uh, we like to think that we're in the right. Um, so I want to begin by exploring uh, two sets of ideas. Uh, ideas that uh, prominent American intellectuals had uh, after 9-11, uh, their reflections and notions of why 9-11 happened, what lessons are to be learned from it, and also the ideas of uh, Islamist intellectuals, not really since 9-11, but I would say since the middle of the 19th century, uh, because from that tradition, 9-11 is located in a larger, longer context. The context of colonialism, the Cold War, and today probably the War on Terror. And then with these two sets of ideas as, as a backdrop, I want to explore um, a very particular history, uh, the history that I think, and this is my own construction, so I offer it to you as, a, as an interpretation, um, as one way uh, of, of making some sense um, of what happened on 9-11. Must be something in my pocket. Faculty House, Columbia University. <laughs> Wrong university. <laughs> so, so I'll, I will, I will, I will speak of, of, of the period from 1975, uh, a year in which U.S foreign policy was in deep crisis, because it's the year that, the year of defeat in Indochina, um, from 1975 onwards. So that's what I'm going to talk about. I have a text, inevitably I'll read from it somewhat. Hopefully, I will not read from it all the time. When the event we know as 9-11 happened, I was in New York City. As the weeks rolled by, 
I read the American press to try and make sense of the kind of debate that was developing in the US. I was struck by reports in the New York Times that more and more Americans were going to bookshops to buy copies of the Quran, the Islamic holy book. to understand the motivation of those who had hijacked the planes and driven them into the Twin Towers. And sure enough, the New York Times reported that the Quran was amongst the highest selling books in American bookshops. It had made the bestseller list. As more weeks rolled by, there came the American invasion of Afghanistan, and then in some years, the invasion of Iraq. I wondered how many Iraqis and Afghanis were going to bookshops to buy copies of the Bible to understand why they were being bombed. I knew, like everybody else, that President Bush in many of his speeches, would claim to have a direct connection with God and claimed inspiration from above. And yet I doubted that Afghanis or Iraqis were reading the Bible for a clue as to why America was bombing them. So I asked myself, why the difference? Why are Americans looking for a clue in the Quran? Why aren't people at home when I go to Kampala going to bookshops to read the Bible. I thought the difference lay, I didn't really think the answer lay with the people who were going to buy the Quran. I think the answer lay with the nature of the public debate in the US. Especially the debate that occupied center stage, the debate that was relayed by the media, uh, the debate in semi-official America prominent intellectuals, not directly in the pay of the government, but close enough. The alternatives in this debate were defined by two prominent intellectuals, Samuel Huntington of Harvard University, my former professor, if I may confess, and Bernard Lewis at Princeton University. Now, as in every disagreement, or as in every debate, their disagreement followed within a common frame. The frame told us the ground they shared in common. And I think that common ground has come to define a kind of common sense in the US. And this common sense is driven by the assumption, not a new assumption, actually. This is an assumption as old as colonialism. And it's the assumption that our world is divided into two. There are modern people, and there are pre-modern people. The difference is, according to this point of view, that modern people make their own culture. They have a reflexive attitude to it. They think about it. They can separate the good from the bad. They can build on the good and correct the bad. And as they build on the good and correct the bad, their culture develops historically. So modern people make progress. But pre-modern peoples, this same story assumes, that pre-modern peoples are born into a culture. They kind of internalize it. They don't have a critical attitude to it. They don't make their culture historically. They're sort of condemned to live it uncritically and content to pass it on from one generation 
to another. Pre-modern peoples are said to wear their culture as if it were a badge. Or to suffer from it like a twitch or a fever. Now that fever used to be thought of as a tropical fever. I come from Uganda. I come from South Asian ancestry, but South Asian family which has been in East Africa for 120 years. So this used to be thought of, the Africans were thought of as quintessentially pre-modern. That was prior to 9-11. Today, it's Muslims who are thought of as quintessentially pre-modern. It is assumed that except for a founding prophetic moment and some monuments, Muslims tend to live their culture as a destiny. And the claim is that you can read the politics of Muslims from their culture. You don't have to do anything else. Just read the Quran and you will know what a Muslim will do. The difference between Huntington and Lewis was on the question, they agreed. What I said, that this distinction between modern and pre-modern, they both agreed. The difference between them was on the question, who is the enemy? Who do we target? That's where they disagreed. Huntington argued that 9-11 was evidence of the clash of civilizations. Huntington said, you ain't seen nothing yet. The Cold War was just a parochial affair. It was an internal affair, a conflict inside the West. Now you're getting a really global conflict, a clash of civilizations. And this clash of civilizations at its core, according to Huntington, will be a war with Islam. For Islam's borders, Huntington said, are bloody. So for Huntington, there was no such person as a good Muslim. The only good Muslim is a dead Muslim for Huntington. Every Muslim is potentially bad. Or the only good one is the one who has renounced, has converted. Bernard Lewis disagreed. Lewis advised the American administration not to take on Islam and Muslims head on. He said it was crucial that the US make a distinction between good and bad Muslims. And that in fact it get good Muslims to confront bad Muslims. It organized good Muslims, resourced them, and quarantined the bad ones. Now the Iraq war was supposed to do this. It was said that once bad Muslims like Saddam Hussein were thrown out of power, the good ones would rise to the occasion, as indeed Eastern Europeans had done. They would garland American soldiers, and that would be the dawn of That would be the, I think, you know what it is? It is this. You know, I lecture a huge undergraduate class with that contraption. And you're right, my cell phone could be another culprit. Machines speak more to one another than do people. <laughs> so. So Bernard Lewis advised the US administration not to take on all Muslims without distinction. Take on the bad ones. He didn't mean by bad Muslim those who are not practicing Islam. Uh, or by good ones, those who are observant Muslims. 
He meant by bad ones, those who were critical of US policy, and good ones were those who were supportive of US policy. Good and bad were political adjectives. So I call this double speak. On the one hand, the assumption that the explanation of the politics of Muslims lies in their culture. And on the other hand, the distinction between good and bad Muslims based not on their cultural orientation, but on their political behavior. I called it culture talk. I also thought this culture talk was convenient and self-serving because it removed the US from the picture. It conveniently explained politics not as the result of a relationship between two or more, but as an inevitable outcome of the culture of one party. I mean, imagine if you slap me. I hope you don't, but if you slap me, and I say, ah, that's his culture. Something wrong with the explanation. Because it's removed from the explanation the relationship between you and me. People don't just go around slapping people. Right? Did I do something? Did I do something? What happened that you slapped me? So at the minimum, the explanation has to begin by focusing on the relationship. So let me talk of political Islam. And I want to locate it historically and also geographically. From the vantage point of 9-11, the particular period which is of interest is the period in which we have an encounter between Western power and Muslim peoples, which is why I want to begin in the middle of the 19th century. I want to begin with an Iranian thinker, Jamaluddin al-Afghani. Al-Afghani traveled a lot. In 1857, when the Indian uprising the biggest uprising against the British Empire took place. Afghani was in India. Afghani witnessed the repression that followed the uprising. And then he wrote about it. And Afghani argued. He said, look, we are being colonized. And we must find the main explanation for this outcome, colonization, in our own weaknesses. And we must begin by addressing our own weaknesses. So Afghani's solution, his analysis was that our weaknesses, that our public affairs are too narrowly constructed. And his solution was to open up public affairs to more and more groups in society, to bring large masses of Muslims into public life. Afghani thought that the solution, the problem was the state, the solution would be society. And more social participation would solve the problem of political weakness. For a hundred years, from the middle of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century, Afghani's solution was generally accepted, right up to the time of the creation of Pakistan in the middle of the 20th century. Islamic political thought remained predominantly community-based and predominantly saw the community, the ummah, as the driving force of change. Then a major shift happened with another thinker called Abu Ala Maududi. 
Madhudi was a journalist in India. He was a journalist of, in India. When Pakistan was created, he moved to Pakistan. He moved to the promised land. Madhudi was a Muslim. He wanted to go to this Islamic state. He got to Pakistan, he was disappointed. He said, but these people are no different from the Indians I left behind. Only their names are different and their rituals are different. Otherwise, they are the same. For those who speak Urdu, Pakistan means the land of the pure, Pak. He said, na Pakistan. This is not the land of the pure. So Maududi lost confidence in the Ummah, in society. He said, no, society is not the solution. Society is the problem. These ordinary Muslims who really are just a bunch of converts, they will have to be made into ideologically correct Muslims. And the only way to do it is through a top-down project from the state. So the state is the solution. We, the advance, the intelligentsia, we must take political power and then implement an ideological project which will make the population Muslim in the true sense of the word. Now, Maududi influenced a third thinker. That's Sayyid Qutb in Egypt. Qutb is the standard bearer of radical political Islam. Qutb wrote a book, he wrote many books but he wrote like a political manifesto, a small book. It's translated into English. You can get it on Amazon, Signposts. It's called Signposts. It's about 80, 90 pages. So when I read the book, um, I was really surprised because I'm somebody who came of political age in the 1960s, 1970s. Sayyid Qutb says in the introduction that he wrote this book for the Islamist vanguard. Vanguard, he uses the word vanguard. I thought I was reading Lenin, what is to be done. And in the text, Qutb argues, his main argument is that the major political task is to distinguish friends from enemies because with friends, you use persuasion, you use reason. With enemies, you use force. So if you mistake a friend for an enemy, you're going to use the wrong method, the wrong resources, the wrong approach. You know, my first job was at the University of Dar es Salaam, 1975. We used to read Mao Zedong, not just Mao Zedong, but among other things. And Mao Zedong wrote a book on the correct handling of contradictions amongst the people. The same message, the same message. Crucial question is to distinguish friend from enemy. Because with friends, when you have differences with friends, you don't use violence. You use persuasion, you use reason. So I ask myself, you take these three people, Jamaluddin al-Afghani, Sayyid Qutb, Jamaluddin al-Afghani, Maududi, and Sayyid Qutb. Take these three. How do you make sense of them? Do you say these are three Muslim thinkers? They belong to a single tradition? You put them in a container called the Islamic tradition, and do you think the influence is just going vertical? from one to two to three? Or do you also think that they live in the world 
And as they live in the world, they are involved in multiple conversations. They're not just involved in a conversation inside the tradition called Islam. So Sayyid Qutb is not just reading Maududi, but they're also involved in conversations with competing ideologies. Sayyid Qutb is also reading Lenin, and he's also reading Mao Zedong. Because 1960s, 1970s, the competing ideologies are national liberation movements, the movements of armed struggle. When Sayyid Qutb embraces political violence, this is nothing extraordinary. This is the mainstream of national liberation, I was going to say theology. The assumption of most national liberation movements in the 1960s and 1970s was that the armed struggle was not only the most effective mode of struggle, it was also the only genuine mode of struggle. But I think that to understand this romance with violence, one has to go beyond the national liberation movement of the 60s and 70s. But it's difficult to go beyond it because it requires us to interrogate ourselves. My central claim is that the embrace of political violence lies at the center of political modernity. Think about it. No century in history has been more violent than the 20th century. Just think of numbers of people killed in world wars, in revolutions, right? staggering. The numbers are staggering. No other century in history compares. Since the French Revolution, violence has been understood as essential to progress. Revolutionary violence was good violence. Bad violence was the violence that tried to stop the march of progress. Remember Marx's famous dictum? Revolution is the midwife of history. I think the romance with political violence has been shared for at least two centuries. And I think that if we think the problem is violence in politics, we need to confront this legacy, this particular notion of modernity. I want to make one more observation before I go on to the period from 1975. Neither Maududi nor Sayyid Qutb were religious intellectuals. They weren't. Maududi was a journalist. Sayyid Qutb was a literary theorist. Right? Came to the US, spent a year. <clears throat> they didn't come from the ulama, which is the religious scholars, what the Iranians call mullahs. They were both non-religious intellectuals. I think actually, if you look at the key intellectuals of contemporary political Islam, from Al Afghani to Maududi to Sayyid Qutb to Ali Shariati in Iran, none of them have come from the domain of religion. They've all come from outside of the formal religious sphere. In this, I think they resemble the key intellectuals of political Hinduism and political Zionism. The key intellectuals of political Zionism were secular intellectuals, not religious intellectuals. So how do we explain this?
I think it would be interesting to look at the contrast with Christianity. In the Christian tradition, and especially in how institutional power is organized, the church is not simply a set of beliefs and a set of practices. It's also an institution. The Catholic Church, in, the, in this sense, the Catholic Church historically duplicated the institutional hierarchy of the Roman Empire. Protestant churches duplicated the institutional hierarchy of the nation state. So that you had an institutional hierarchy from the floor to the ceiling. So you had parallel hierarchies. You had the state hierarchy and the church hierarchy. And the question of secularism was about the relationship between these two hierarchies. The question of secularism was about observing, about policing the border making sure that borders could not be crossed. And the state policed the border. There's no such hierarchy in mainstream Islam, in Sunni Islam. There's no priesthood. It doesn't exist. You have six people. One person is a prayer leader. That's it. You have the ulama the religious scholars who issue fatwa. But the fatwa is not binding. The fatwa is a legal opinion. If I have a problem, I know when my father, I remember a conversation at home, right? They had a problem, which was, you collect 10%. Everybody gives 10% of their income, zakat. Give 10% of the income. So the problem was, how was it to be spent? So they had this discussion. And the discussion was actually this. Which ayatollah should we ask to give a fatwa on this? Or if we ask so and so, the fatwa is most likely going to be this. If we ask so and so, it's most likely going to be this. What's the outcome we want? And who is the ayatollah most likely to give that fatwa? That's the one we will ask. And if we don't like that fatwa, we can go to another one. But there's no religious hierarchy. There's no institutionalized power. In Shia Islam, in Iran, after the Iranian revolution, you have a religious hierarchy. You have the vilayatul faqih. You have the mullahs as a custodian clerical custodians, constitutional guardians, in a sense. And the democracy functions. If the democracy here functions within a constitution, the Iranians will tell you that ours also functions within a constitution, except that our Supreme Court, our guardians of the constitution, are the ulama. Khomeini's innovation of creating this hierarchy is not accepted universally in Shia Islam. If you go to Iraq with Sistani, it's a different orientation. Okay, so let me come to the set of events that bring us to 9-11. As I said, I want to begin with 1975, the year of the American defeat in Vietnam. It's also the year of the collapse of the Portuguese Empire. It's the year the center of gravity of the Cold War shifts from Southeast Asia to Southern Africa. The Portuguese Empire has collapsed. Its former colonies are going to become independent 
Angola, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau. Who is going to be master? The Cold War focuses in the, on that part of the world. The revolution breaks out in Angola, 1974-75. Henry Kissinger is convinced that this is really a Soviet ploy. And the Soviet Union is moving into this part of the world. But Kissinger knows that the US cannot intervene because of Vietnam. If you can't intervene because of Vietnam, you must get somebody else to intervene. And there begins an era of proxy war. The proxy is apartheid South Africa. But the minute it gets known that the white troops that entered Angola were South Africans, it becomes discredited throughout the African continent. And Kissinger forces the South Africans to leave. In the next few years, there are several other revolutions. But two of them are most important. In 79, there's the Sandinista revolution in Nicaragua and the Iranian revolution, these two. In 1980, Ronald Reagan comes to power. And this, I think, is the crucial period. If we want to understand the politics of the war on terror, we've got to keep in mind the politics forged during the presidency of Ronald Reagan. Reagan comes to power. Reagan makes two claims, which will subsequently be known as the Reagan Doctrine. The Reagan Doctrine says, first of all, says America is preparing for the wrong war. It's preparing for a war in Europe. It's preparing for a war that's never going to be. It's preparing for a war against Soviet armies and tanks in Europe, a repeat of the Second World War. Not going to happen. But because it is preoccupied with the war that is not going to happen, it is losing the war that's actually happening. And Reagan says the war that's happening is the war that's going on in the Third World. These nationalist governments that are coming into power in the third world, says Reagan, are actually Soviet proxies. And that's the war we are losing. That's the first claim Reagan makes. The second claim Reagan makes is that peaceful coexistence, this notion of tolerance and pluralism, is just a code word for defeat. that America has to get away from notions of peaceful coexistence. The Soviet Union is on a roll, and the Soviet Union has to be rolled back. The Reaganite point of view is fashioned as an intellectual argument by Gene Kirkpatrick. Gene Kirkpatrick wrote an article in Commentary magazine called Dictatorships and Double Standards. And then she wrote a book by that name. Now, in this article and book, Kirkpatrick distinguished between two kinds of dictatorships, right-wing dictatorships and left-wing dictatorships. And she said right-wing dictatorships were organic because they were the result of internal histories of these societies. She called them authoritarian. Left-wing dictatorships she called totalitarian because she said they are not the product of internal histories. They are the result of an external takeover by the Soviet Union. They've been imposed from the outside and therefore they are historically illegitimate. So she said, we don't have to worry about right-wing dictatorships, the authoritarian ones, because since they've been brought to power from within, they'll be overthrown from within. We have to worry about the left-wing dictatorships, the totalitarian ones, 
because they're propped up from the outside. If they are propped up from the outside, we must overthrow them from the outside. Kirkpatrick's significance is that she made a moral and intellectual case for making friends with right-wing regimes while doing everything to overthrow left-wing, even nationalist regimes from without. Reagan made another big change. Reagan brought the language of religion into politics. In a speech before the National Association of Evangelicals, Reagan dubbed the Soviet Union the evil empire. Now, I think it's important to understand the political uses of the language of evil. First, a war against evil is a permanent war. It doesn't stop. It's a permanent war. Second, you cannot coexist with evil. If you coexist with evil, you capitulate to evil. You must destroy evil or be destroyed. And in the fight against evil, any alliance is permissible because nothing is worse than evil. You can hear echoes of the war on terror. Using this highly moral language, Reagan established the most amoral alliances. The first alliance was with South Africa. The Reagan administration called it constructive engagement. Under constructive engagement, the Reagan administration created Africa's first genuinely terrorist movement. What I mean by genuinely terrorist movement is a movement that deliberately targets civilian populations, not where civilian populations are collateral damage, as the language goes, but they are deliberately targeted. The movement they created, Renamo in Mozambique, a movement which kidnapped children, which forced children into acts of terror, usually on their own family members, The Reagan administration did not participate directly, but it provided political cover to South Africa while it did this. And it learned from it because the lessons are the ones it put into practice in Nicaragua. When the Contras were created by the Reagan administration, they were no different from Renamo in Mozambique. Mozambique was a laboratory The lessons were applied elsewhere. Nicaragua was only the first place. The second place was Afghanistan. But two things were different in Afghanistan. One was, in both, in both Mozambique and Nicaragua, both Renamo and the Contras, were put forth as national liberation groups, national groups. So even though you could have foreigners in the Contra, most of the Contras had to be Nicaraguans. Most of the Renamo had to be Mozambicans. In Afghanistan, they threw overboard the notion of a national group because they didn't trust them. They didn't trust that these guys would continue to fight the Soviets to the end. What if they made a compromise? What if they made a deal? So in Afghanistan, the National Liberation War was replaced by a religious jihad. And the recruitment was of Muslim jihadis throughout the Islamic world. The recruitment was of two kinds of characters, sometimes religious devotees, but most of the times the most asocial, antisocial, excuse me, characters, let out of prison to go and fight in Afghanistan. An entire network of schools was created to train what were called the Arab Afghans. 
Now, these schools used the name, the same name as that of Islamic religious schools, historically, the madrasa. But in reality, these schools were completely different from the historical madrasa. They were militarized. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example of a, from the curriculum. U USAID, United States Agency for International Development, USAID, gave a grant of $50 million to the University of Nebraska to write textbooks for the madrasas in Pakistan, training for the Afghan Jihad. So let me give you an example, a math textbook written by the University of Nebraska for a grade three student, a nine-year-old. Here's a question. One group of Mujahideen, Mujahideen is the Afghan jihadi fighter. One group of Mujahideen attack 50 Russian soldiers. In that attack, 20 Russians are killed. How many Russians fled? Okay. Very simple question, right? But not so simple. Then take the grade four textbook, 10-year-old. Here's a question. The speed of a Kalashnikov bullet is 80 meters per second. If a Russian is at a distance of 3,200 meters from a Mujahid, and that Mujahid aims at the Russian's head, calculate how many seconds it will take for the bullet to strike the Russian in the forehead. There. Again, 3,200 divided by 800 is four seconds. But the bullet that's gone into the student's head is the main part of the story. So these madrasas presented Islam as an alternative to communism. The Haqqani group, which the Obama administration keeps on talking about as one of the key Taliban groups that they are fighting with their refuge still in Pakistan. The Haqqani group was created during that period. Well, I'm going to close. I think we're at a difficult period in history. We've come out of a Cold War. We came out of a Cold War 10 years ago or so, 11, 12 years ago. But it was a hot war in the third world. None of us should be lured or lulled by the term Cold War to forget the hot wars, the militarization of the state, the destruction of ordinary lives that were the consequences of that war, the proxy wars waged in the third world. The Soviet Union lost the Cold War. And the Soviet Union went through a set of reforms the U.S. won the Cold War, but because it won, it didn't go through any reforms. It actually paid a price for winning the Cold War. You can see some of that in the national security state. You can see some of that in an imperial presidency when it comes to foreign policy. You can see some of that in the fact that foreign policy is made more by the Department of Defense than it is by the Department of State. You can see it in the fact that there was no peace dividend in the US. That in spite of the end of the Cold War, the military budget kept on rising and rising and rising. So that today, the American military budget equals the military budgets of all countries in the world put together. Half of all money spent in this world on military is American. 
I don't think I need to say anymore. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Mandani, for a, a wonderful talk. Now we invite people to come up and ask questions. And um, there was a great cartoon in the New Yorker a week or so ago. Please don't, <laughs> in the words of that uh, cartoon, please don't disguise your questions with small, with small speeches, as small speeches. So please ask questions, but uh, get as many in as we can. Thank you. Thank you for your speech tonight, sir. Um, you said... Uh, Maybe you can say who you are, so I know at least... Oh, I'm sorry. My name is me. Bob Boone. I'm from The Reader. Um, near the end, you said that Russia lost their ideological war with Muslims in Afghanistan. Uh, and I guess you could argue the same in Chechnya. Can you imagine a ideology or a game plan for the United States to take whereby we would win an ideological war of ideas that would allow us to get past this time of conflict. Well, um, maybe the first uh, question is, uh, is the U.S. fighting an ideological war? I mean, is this a war about American values or American interests? Uh, if it's a war about values, what are the values? Are the values pluralism? Are the values tolerance? Um, no, it's a rhetorical question. I'm, I'm actually answering you. <laughs> I'm allowed to give small speeches. You, you're not. <laughs> So, you know, my, my, uh, my claim uh, is that really, uh, if it's an ideological war, ideological wars are not fought with weapons. Uh, the weapon of debate is reason, discourse. It's not guns. It's not bombs. You can't bomb people into thinking like you. You can only talk to them. Just the evidence seems to suggest to me that the ideological war seems deeply buried somewhere under this rubble. Um, and that the real war seems to be about something else. But Thank you. Thank you for a compelling discussion, especially for our students here. My question has to do with culture talk and its relation to human rights, the rhetoric of human rights. And I wonder if you could perhaps draw a connection between culture talk as embodied in Huntington and Lewis, as you discussed so persuasively, and if there is a connection between culture talk and the triumph of human rights perhaps at the expense, distressingly, at international law. That seems to be the new measure of accountability, so we see the Bushies invading this country and the other in the name of human rights and clearly um, dispensing with international law. Tough question, but good question. Um, Well, I think there are two, uh, two aspects to this. Uh, one has to do with law. Uh, the other one has to do with the transgression of law. So let me begin with the transgression of law. Um, uh, and this was obvious during the Iraq war uh, and Bush's determination to go to war in spite of his failure to get UN resolutions. Um, and, uh, and his claim was that in the face of right, rights, 
law doesn't matter. Um, so in a way, that was the most obvious demonstration of when rights becomes the language of power, because rights became the language of power. Um, but I think that we have a deeper problem uh, today, um, which is this. Uh, and, and I think it is manifest in uh, what has happened to uh, human rights groups, um, even the mainstream human rights groups. Uh, if you take, um, take Human Rights Watch um, and, and uh, I wrote a book on Darfur and this is what brought me sort of face to face with this thing. Um, human rights groups uh, argue today that all violence must be treated as criminal violence. And if it is criminal violence, then the only effective antidote to that violence is punishment and the only effective institution to dole out that punishment is the court, particularly the International Criminal Court. So what does this tell us? This tells us that in all violence, one side is right and the other side is wrong because that's what happens in a court of law. In a court of law, you decide who is right and who is wrong. Right? And one party is punished. As somebody who's studied for decades political violence in the African context, I started studying uh, the Rwandan genocide. As I studied it, I began to look at the history of violence. And the more I looked at the history of violence, the more I realized that actually there has been a cycle of violence and that actually the perpetrator has not always been the perpetrator, and the victim has not always been the vi victim. They've tended to trade sides. That punishment simply, each side has its narrative of victimhood, and punishment simply reinforces the ni narrative of victimhood. Now, if you take, take Human Rights Watch, read any of its documents, what you will find is, you find first page, page and a half is a pro forma reference to history and context. But the main attention is what they call name and shame. Document atrocities, identify the perpetrator, Demand punishment of the perpetrator. That's it. What's the issue? They don't care. What is the issue? Why the violence? Why are people fighting? If you go to Save Darfur, that's what I worked on, so I give you that example. If you go to the website, it's all about violence. Nothing about the issue. Why are people fighting one another? What happened? I call it a pornography of violence. Because it caters to the lust of the viewer. It's not you. See? See? And it encourages you to think of yourself as the solution. Those guys as the problem. I think the criminal narrative doesn't help. We need a political narrative. We need a narrative of the violence, which doesn't treat it as a standalone event, but as a cycle of violence. And the cycle is not driven by perpetrators. It's driven by issues. What's the issue that keeps on being unresolved? From an African point of view, the paradigm is the transition from apartheid. 
I mean, God knows it's a crime against humanity, but nobody was tried. No one. No one was put in jail. The demand was not identify perpetrators and put them in jail. The, actually, it was the reverse. Decriminalize the adversary. Talk to them. Forget the dead. The living must have a second chance. Forget criminal justice because criminal justice requires military victory. There's no need for military victory. The point is change the rules of the game. The point is political justice. You change the rules of the game, the rules of politics in South Africa, you have a transition. So I think that the human rights movement with its single-minded focus on criminal justice, courts, and therefore military victory is folding up with the American military machine. That's my problem. Hi. I'm Amy Shuster. Is this on? Uh, I teach political theory at the University of Minnesota Duluth. Uh, so that might tell you a little bit about my question. Uh, I'm interested in this way that you want to characterize um, modernity as being the embrace of violence, and I wanted you to say a little bit more about that. I start off my political theory classes teaching my students about the Persian Wars and the Peloponnesian Wars, and we read Thucydides, and we learn that the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must, and I see this as a continuity, um, and yet there's some distinction that you'd like to make about the modern period being an embrace of violence or political violence, and then I see Gandhi and I see Martin Luther King. So could you say a little bit more about that? Okay. Yeah. Um, modern political theory. High modern political theory. Um, has a cast the pre-modern as the problem, the modern as the solution, religion as the problem, secular as the solution. The critics of high modernity, um, starting with Benjamin Levinas, have uh, argued that actually the claims of modern theory should be investigated as a set of pretensions because all they have done is they've secularized theology. They've taken the sovereignty of God and turned it into so the sovereignty of the legislator. I have some sympathy with that uh, position. I don't, I don't agree that the problem is religion. Uh, <clears throat> I think the politicization of religion has been a work of modernity. I think that, uh, sure, there was a lot of violence throughout history. Uh, Michael Mann argues in his, in one of his books, The Dark Side of Democracy, I think. Uh, and it's a persuasive argument. He argues that the difference between the violence is that whatever instance you find in the Old Testament of some village demolished or the Romans demolishing, or the Greeks, or that it's, it's place specific. It's never group, never group specific. The target is never defined as a race, as an ethnic group, 
as, a, as an identity. It's defined as the residence of a particular place, the disobedience of God, but never generalized. Never a situation where the explanation for the violence is the culture of the perpetrator. Psychology of the perpetrator or the culture of the perpetrator. I think that in the shift from the sovereignty of God to the sovereignty of man, we have had to find a new source of legitimation for political power. And we found that legitimation in a constructed identity. We called it the nation, but sometimes the race, sometimes and we have waged untold violence against those who don't belong to the nation or the race or the group. That's modern. Hello, uh, my name is Jaylon Kapol. I'm a student here um, and former uh, Gulf War veteran. Oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Dave Lance DePoe. I'm a student here, and uh, I also served in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, the question that I have for you is earlier in your speech, you talked about the 20th century being the most violent and the most deaths. <clears throat> and moving into the, cent the century that we're in, with the limited resources and the population growing, I mean, it kind of seems bleak. What is your outlook on that? I should ask you that question. <laughs> well, I mean, just with what we're seeing historically, um, my opinion is I, I, I think I think with the uh, limited resources, I, I'm, I think we're living in some scary times, to be honest. I know that sounds really uh, pessimistic, but with things that I've seen overseas, and uh, I just pray that, that I don't see the things I've seen over there in our country, so, and <laughs> I was, I was kind of interested in your outlook on that. Well, I, I mean, look, I think we are running against the limits of our own hubris, uh, against the consequences of our own hubris, not simply uh, in our relations with one another, but even in our relations with the environment and the earth and uh, we're discovering that there have to be limits. Um, we're, I think in our relationship with one another, and this is what religion uh, 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 teaches and what the postmodernists drew from religion, uh, uh, is, is, is respect for the other. Is always that element of doubt, right? Is, is always the absence of that total certainty that you're always right is always knowing that you never know fully, that knowledge doesn't stop. Knowledge is an endless process. So you must always allow for the fact that you may not be right, right? which doesn't stop you from acting. But the action is always provisional. It's always provisional. It's so, so that certainty of the killer, of the mass killing, that's what's, um, well, what we need to think about. Now, of course, our problem is that uh, we have this massive uh, uh, instrument of violence, which is global, more in some places, less in other places, but global. Um, and, and the only answer seems to be to create alternate centers of waging violence. Um, at some point, we've got to begin to figure this out uh, and, and, and look for, violence is not its own explanation. But I'm, I'm afraid that uh, you've discovered my own limits. Thank you. 
This is about as far as I can go. Hi, my name is Bob Weber, a uh, citizen of Duluth, school bus driver, and a veteran of Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, I ask you, sir, what is wrong with the world's largest military budget when a generation ago it was along those lines that Nazism, imperialism in Japan, and fascism in Italy was defeated with such strength as that. When you have an enemy in Islamism that will not negotiate, one must assume that it has to be stopped. I, I reject your argument that of pointing the finger inward and giving Mr. Reagan an awful lot of credit I met some Mujahideen in Afghanistan that had no ideas that Reagan started their movement. So I ask you, if that model is not a proven model that works, then why are many people gonna drive home tonight in a Volkswagen, a Honda, a Toyota, a Kia, or a Hyundai? Thank you. Well, if the point of defeating Nazism, Japan, and fascism is to then go ahead and build the biggest military machine in human history, instead of showing us an alternative way of living in the world, then I think the point is lost. If the US is going to manage to live in the world rather than occupy it, if it's going to convince people, it has to show an alternative way of living in the world. It has to show that weapons are not the only way of making your point. Um, my name is Nurmud. I'm a student here, you know, junior. I just want to ask you a question and. You know, the Muslims in the Middle East, you know, they see this war in Middle East as the war against Islam, you know. So, and we see what, we, what is going on now in, Af in Palestine, Afghanistan, Iraq. And you say that secularism is the solution. Okay, do you believe that American invasion in Iraq or Afghanistan can create the secularism? Do you believe that? Wait, 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 I didn't say Islam is the solution. No, no, you said secularism is the solution in your view. No, I didn't say that. I said. No, I, look, what I said, let, let me, maybe I didn't say, uh, whatever I said wasn't clear. The first let, me, let me clarify. Um, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, I don't buy the idea that religion and secularism stand opposed. Okay. I don't buy the idea that one is the problem and the other is the solution. I don't buy the idea that modernity sprang from like Athena from the head of Zeus. No history. I think we must locate the thing we call secularism in a whole human history and give credit where credit is due. I think a lot, a lot of the treasure that was built through religious discourses, religious books, was carried into secularism as so much common sense. Common sense, secularized common sense. In that sense, I think there is a Christian secularism there is a Jewish secularism, there is an Islamic secularism, there is a Hindu secularism. I am a Muslim secularist. I'm secular, but I'm a Muslim. 
There are different secular traditions, just as there are different religious traditions. And what I don't accept is the demonization, either pre-modernity or religion. I don't accept that. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, this is not the end. This is only the end in this room. Uh, Professor Mondami and I are going to run around the corner, and we're going to, I'm going to plant him behind a, a table, and he might sell a few books. I don't know. But in any case, you still have an opportunity to engage in, uh, in a unilateral dialogue with him. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this is the, the third uh, lecture in this series will be in February. Look for more information about that even in the, uh, in the lobby. Thanks so much.